Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, most of the videos that I shoot are techniques that I've developed over the years around my shop or maybe inspired by things that I've seen or questions that I've been asked. This particular video is a kind of a response or a, a reaction to a video I watched during the week. And everybody works differently. Everybody has their own technique. This is a fact. I mean, if you put 10 machinists, 10 tool makers in a room, chances are you're going to see a project done nine different ways. Well, I'm real big on the, on the philosophy behind a job and the technique and the, and the ability to repeat that part 10, 15, 100 times if you have to. So winging it is okay if you're only making one and you're really not worried about precision. Have at it. Work to a scribe line. But if you want to know the technique or evolve a little bit in your abilities, then I've got something to share with you. And we're talking about Tangent arcs. Now, there's a, just don't click off just yet, but there's a reason for this, so watch this. If you have angles, square, rectangle, single angle, acute, obtuse, it doesn't matter, angle, and it looks like this. Let's, let's start with this one for now. You have an angle. You want to put a radius in this corner. You want a specific radius in that corner, but you don't know where the center of the radius is. Well, there's a technique or a construction technique, title, whatever, called an inscribed arc, an inscribed circle, and that is very important to know exactly what's going on when you do this. You want an arc of a very specific size. What do you do? Well, you take that radius that you want to create, and you strike a line parallel to the two lines that you are trying to connect with that arc or blend. Okay, there's your radius. There's your radius. There's your center point. That is the point of rotation at which this radius value will go tangent to both of these surfaces. Outstanding. That's a great way to do it. And if you know the angle here, then you'll know what's happening here. There is another thing that happens when you do this, and I'm going to increase the size so I can increase the scale of this and show you exactly what's going on. I'm actually going somewhere with this, so hang in there. Let's put that center of rotation out here somewhere. Same setup, right? Two parallel lines. Okay, guys, I zoomed in on that so you can actually see what's going on here. What we know is these two lines are offset by the radius that you want. Okay? The radius that you want is right here. That's an important piece of this drawing. When you have the center and you swing your arc in here, I'd rather not touch those lines because it will contaminate my marker. If all went well, this is going to look like I want it to look. Anytime you have an arc tangent to two surfaces, it's always going to project to the center of the arc at a right angle perpendicular to the surface that it's tangent to. Now, you're going to have to roll it back and play that four times before you get it, but here we go. I'll just draw it. Point of tangency. Point of tangency. Straight down. Right down. Right angle. Right angle. All day long. Simple. Let's take a look at the angle that we have. This angle here is going to be this angle here. And lo and behold, right in the center, center to corner. sector. Two identical triangles. So by doing this, doing this math, you have everything that you need to find that point right there. That might be a hole, that might be the trajectory of an end mill, because the end mill is the correct radius. It could be any number of things. But knowing this construction is very important. Now that's an inscribed arc. No big deal. Let's say if this was a 40 degrees, 
Each one of these would be 20. And when it comes time to do the triangle, to figure out the math, you have the radius as the base leg, half of the angle as the projected angle, and when you figure out this leg right here, that gives you this distance right there. So if you know this distance here, and you know this distance, you know right where to stop for that. Now that's, you have to look at that for a while, but that's important. Let's take it one step further. symmetrical triangle. This is, you'll see what I mean. I'm going to make sure that that is framed. I want you to see this. Now very much like the two lines or the two surfaces, when you have three surfaces, there is a point in space where if you were to draw a line parallel to each one of these edges, you would have the center of this feature right here with an inscribed circle because a circle will ride inside of this. And I'm going to do it with the black, hopefully the scale, close enough to scale. Ah, close enough. Let's do that. Okay. Inscribed circle. Tangent here. Tangent here. Tangent here. Why does this matter? Stay tuned. When you do this, you can now break this up for the sake of demonstration. Let's go with one inch. It's an easy number, right? Split that right in half, which is what I meant by symmetrical. Now this demonstration of splitting that in half is not always going to work unless these angles are the same, okay? These angles have to be the same. It's the only way that's going to work. The inscribed circle will work with any triangle, but the only time it's going to be on center is if these outer angles are identical. It's the only time. Let's keep chopping this thing up. Now we know we have a circle in there, but we don't know what the radius is. You'd have to sit and draw a million parallel lines to these surfaces before you ever came up with that radius, or you could just use a specific formula. I'm going to show you right now. Now if this could be a 60 degree triangle, that would make it too easy, because all the triangles would be the same. So for sake of math, let's make this, for how about 54? How does that sound? There's a random number for you. Knowing that this is a 54 degree angle, that makes this what? 27. Cumulative total of all the angles inside of a triangle, 180. So you have 90 here, 27 here, which makes the top, I actually wrote it down because I don't feel like doing it in my head. Sixty-three. A lot of stuff is happening here. Stay with it. Showed you before, the tangent point of any arc inside of any contact surface is always 90 degrees to the center. That helps. That helps a lot. We'll let's do that. There you go. I'm still going to just check this out. Hope that's staying tuned in. Beautiful. Love it. Now look at what you have. 63 degrees. Now here you go. Boom, 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 boom. We're going to put more lines on here. We're going to make swish cheese out of this triangle by the time we're done. How many different triangles just fell out of that graphic? 
two. There's six represented here, but there's only two triangles that are different. So now we're getting to the easier part. This triangle here is the same as this triangle here, same as this triangle here, same as this triangle here. Since it's longer, because of 54, if that was a 60, it would be symmetrical, but with the 54, excuse me, the sides would be symmetrical. The length would still be different. I know someone's going to correct me on that. This triangle here is the same as this triangle here. So now it's getting simpler. If you want to make something like this, if you want to mill something like this consistently, you only have to figure out these two triangles. And then the rotary table work is cake, absolute cake. Because as soon as you figure out this triangle right here, once you have the map, let me see if I can do it for you. We're going to call this triangle, triangle O. We have 63 degrees total. Got to have half of it. So the tip angle right here is 31 degrees, 30 minutes. This leg is 1 inch, so that makes this... 0.5. That makes this 0.5. So break out your shop calculator, break out your trig book, go online, wave your magic wand, ask Siri what that other third leg turns out to be. 306. 306 and 4 tenths to be exact. Once you have that leg right there, that triangle is a given. It's already there. You don't have to worry about how big that circle is, anything. When you have this 3064 that fell out, there's your radius. That is the radius of the circle. That's this leg, that's this leg, that is this leg. Once you know that this is 0.5, this is also 0.5. Because these two triangles are the same. Now you're going to be able to get this leg here. If you just pick at these problems one piece at a time, things will come to you. Okay, so you put a circle in there just for a visual, and as soon as you put the construction lines inside that circle, all the triangles pop out, and you say, oh, well, this is basic now. All you need to do is figure out sides and angles. Now, the reason that this is important, this inscribed circle, if you were doing this on a rotary table, that's your center point of rotation right there. The center point of rotation in this particular feature is not the center of the triangle. It's the center of the inscribed circle. That makes this so much easier. It's not even funny. You shift the table over the length of the radius, and you move up to your corner. Mill your line. When you rotate this, this is the only other difference. You have one side that's consistent, and on these two sides you have arc values of 0.5 on each side, and then this leg right here as the second move. It's consistent, it's accurate, it's repeatable, and it's right there. That is a lot of stuff to absorb. I'd like to take it out to the rotary table if I can, put the part directly on the rotary table, clamp it down, and show you exactly how quick this can be to cut. Okay, before we actually lay out the part, I want to show you that the actual center of the part is not the center of rotation. I believe that we've already established that. Okay, by looking at all the numbers that you have available to you to work with, the 27 degree here, you know the hypotenuse, you know the height. Now, if I got that wrong, forgive me. I always call this the height, and I always call that the long leg, so if it's not, whatever. By having all this information here, there are several different ways that you can calculate this base leg. Once you calculate that base leg, you'll know where the center of the actual feature is. Okay, the center of the feature is not the center of rotation. We are going to set this part up on the machine so that the center of the rotary table is right here. But we're going to lay it out so that the center of the part is right here. That's a little confusing, but based on the size of the material that you use, 
you can determine where the end of your material is based on the beginning of your feature using this then you must back out the radius value or the difference to the radius value and in this case it's 184 for me so let's lay this triangle out let's show you how quick it could possibly be and uh, let's get after it all right here's my working part I'm going to lay a scale on here and I'm going to say well that's my center my center needs to be 1.063 and I know from the end of my part, based on how long my part is, and the graphic that I just showed you, that the center of rotation is 1 inch 981 in. That's almost 2 inches, so we're going to just go just shy of the 2 inch mark. And by using the rotary table parallel fence, an adjustable parallel, and one of these guys, a little selfless self-promotion here, we're going to hit these numbers without actually making a triangle on this part. No dicum necessary, blue or red. Once you have successfully trammed your spindle to the center of your rotary table, the conventional way, a lot of people put indicators, indicator holders on their spindle and track the center of the rotary table but you are functionally using the rotational features of the rotary table against the center line of the spindle. Put your indicator on your spindle like I have it here. Spin the spindle. Make sure the outside is true to the bearings. This is a good place to start. Once you've got everything exactly in this position, Unlock the dial mechanism from the table and freehand spin the table or crank it if you so desire and watch the indicator reading as it goes around because now instead of checking this feature to the spindle you are checking the bearings and the workings of the table to the spindle. This is the more accurate way to verify and you might be surprised at what you find out. So if you can unlock everything and spin the table by hand tracking the outside of the spindle like this will verify that any zero reading that you have or think you have is going to come immediately apparent that uh, you need to make an adjustment or you can trust what you have. All right, let's put this thing back on zero. Pretty close like that. Uh, we're going to lock it back to zero and I know that this rail in the back is always true to the x-axis travel when the rotary table is at zero. So a good parallel surface is not a bad thing to have. You don't have to mess around with uh, squares or whatever. This makes this setup a little quicker. Let's put the part on there and line it up. First step in this process would be to put the part on the table with some degree of accuracy. I mean, you can do it however you want to do it, but I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with an adjustable parallel on the back and a reference tool in the spindle. And this would be the reference tool. This is our alignment pin. If you already have one of these, now pay attention to how this is done because you can actually get yourself in trouble if you do this backwards. My table is currently zero to the spindle. My rotary table is zero to the spindle. And my alignment tool is now locked in a three-quarter collet. This tool has a zero plane face and three 500 faces, which means these faces, this one, this one, and this one on the other side, are 500 off center. And this one in the middle is right on center. Now I'm going to go fumble fingers on you here for a second and show you what not to do, okay? This is what you don't want to do. Let's just say you're going to use an adjustable parallel 
and make sure your part is taller than your parallel and your parallel can fit underneath the tool. Right now I'm going to dial the table 1 inch 063 y-axis pulling the table towards me. Okay, 1 inch 063. I always go beyond and turn my dials clockwise to finish. Always have, always will. Okay, 1 inch 063. Now I'm going to bump the part up against the, up against the pin. Now right now I could lock this down and that edge would be 1 inch 063 away from the center of this spindle all day long. But there's nothing to guarantee that it's parallel to that back rail. So if you stick an adjustable parallel underneath it, or behind it, excuse me, and I know some of you guys are just cringing in your seats right now because you know where I'm headed with this, squeeze that parallel and if you have five hands try to keep pressure against the pin, try to keep the parallel against the back rail and just make sure everything comes home at the same time. But, here's the but, if you get a little too anxious with the adjustable parallel you can push the part off the pin. Can you see the gap right there? Alright, so what's the solution to that? The solution to that, and this is the suggested way, is to rotate this 180 degrees. One hundred eighty degrees. Now that edge is still one inch 063 from the center of the table. I'm going to drop this down just above the table, put my parallel back in there, and now I have a rigid, solid, reliable stop for the pin. With the machine out of gear, I'm going to rotate this pin gently back and forth while the parallel expands. Okay, when the parallel stops expanding, when it stops moving and the or excuse me, when the pin stops moving and the parallel stops expanding, this surface that you have just established right here on the front is 1 inch 063 from the center of the table. These adjustable parallels are very sensitive. I'm going to give it just a small twist to assure that it doesn't go anywhere. And I'm going to get off of it. Alright. The Y axis is now established dimensionally and parallel to the table all day long. I'm going to bring my pin back down somewhere within the boundary of the part. Moving the y-axis right now is not going to affect the setup because whenever you return the digital or the dial, you're going to go right back to where you want to be. So let's just, for yucks, put this back on zero. You can put it anywhere you want, but I'm going to put mine back on zero. Alright, I am back on zero at the center of the part. Now I need the 1 inch 981 on the X. So I'm going to take the zero face, which is the short face, and I'm going to face it to the right. And I'm going to move the table to the right. One inch, 981. And clockwise back to it. Alright. Move the part out, move the pin down. Same procedure. Gentle pressure against the back. Move this until it doesn't wiggle anymore. And that was your first clamp time. Nothing's moving. Zero face, one inch 981 away on the X, one inch 063 on the back. And I am going to put my first clamp on while everything is in position. Going to get the pin off the part as not to influence the part. Lift. Install the second clamp. Take a look at that.
I leave this rail attached to my rotary table. It is trammed zero, indicated zero to the x-axis of the machine. And when my dials here and here are on zero, I can trust that that is true to the world. Now if I was doing a bunch of these, I'd put another stop right here so that I could bump these plates in and out of this setup all day long, returning this exactly to the 1 inch 981, 1 inch 063 center of rotation for the triangle feature. Part is securely clamped. Table is 0, 0, X and Y. All dials are returned to the zero position. And just for sake of confirmation, I will bring the cutter down, which is a 1 8 4 flute. I wouldn't usually do this with a, with a 4 flute, but I know it's nice and sharp and it's small. So I'm going to come down, I'm going to spot the top of the part about 5 thou deep, and I'm going to take a real hard look at those two lines that I put on there before to give myself a visual confirmation that I am in the ballpark. And that's an understatement. I know I'm dead on, but I need to stick the uh, end mill. It's going to put a spot right there. It's going to be to the right of that 981 line because I was well shy of that when I laid it out. it slightly to the right of the 981 line and I would say pretty much in line with the 1 HO 63 first cut x-axis 306 y-axis 0.5 we're gonna drop down we're gonna cut this leg right here x-axis move 306 y-axis move 0.5 bring the cutter down into the part make a one inch cut 0.5 to center 0.5 beyond center Turn the cut to the center position for cut number two. Second cut, starting with the tool back at center, the zero zero location. We're going to rotate the part 27 degrees. We're going to make a 306 y axis move, a 601 x axis move, drop it down at point A, come all the way across to point C. Cut number two, 27 degree rotation initially. And that is 333 on the dial. One side will be 27 and the other side will be 360 degrees minus 27. So that's where we are right now. To make a Y axis shift of the radius 306. And an X axis shift of the long leg of the larger triangle in the graphic 601. Let's drop it down in there and check it out. Center on the X to zero. 
0.5 to the meat. Far so good. Let's return the table to the neutral position. Zero, zero. Cut her back to center. Third cut. Part reestablished to the neutral zero position. Cut her back on the center of the part. We're going to rotate 27 degrees in the opposite direction. We're going to make a 306 Y axis move, a 0.5 X axis move, drop the cutter in, run it all the way across, and with any kind of luck, we're going to fall right in the pocket from the previous cut. Cut number three, 27 degrees in the opposite direction. For the graphic 306, which is the radius of the inscribed circle, y-axis move. The table is moving away from us now. And I'm going to start this cut in the corner. For the deflection, I want the cutter walking into the pocket, not into the parent material. 0.5 on the x. Drop it down. All the corners made very clean. I'm going to return the table to zero, clean out the field. Let's do it. There you have it. You can go as deep or as long or as shallow or as wide or whatever you want to do, you can do it. Now if my math is correct, it's the same distance from the tip of that triangle to the edge and from the corners to the edge all the way around. Let's take this out, throw it on the bench, take a look at it, and prove that. Let's see if the math worked out. Using my handy dandy digital here with the last forever batteries. 618. Not even going to go the other way. I would say we are spot on, fellas. Spot on. Let's give it a visual here. 506.
Now the beauty of a precision setup is if you got to change anything, you can go back in. You can make the corners different, you can make it deeper, you can chamfer these, you can do whatever you want. But by working it out in the math, it only takes a couple of minutes. I know the demonstration probably made it look a little bit scary, but there's really no reason to be scared of it. If you have all the numbers on the print, you have pretty much everything you need to work with. There it is. It's a piece of cake. No scribed lines, no nothing. The layout time was coming up with two dimensions and a spot in the center, and we're good to go.